Bienvenidas, bienvenidos. Mi nombre es Benjamín Mayer, soy el director de 17 Institutos de Estudios Críticos y tengo el gusto de ser co-curador de este seminario junto con Beatriz Miranda Galarza. Estoy sentado frente a un librero, tengo lentes, tengo una barba blanca, soy de tez clara, estoy vestido de oscuro con un saco a cuadros, a rayas grises. Estoy muy honrado de poder conversar con Evelyn Glenny eh, en una sesión que llamamos Enseñar el mundo a escuchar. Voy a presentar brevemente a la artista y después comenzará nuestra conversación. Dame Evelyn Glenny es nada menos que la principal percusionista solista del mundo. Se presenta con las mejores orquestas, directores y artistas. Sus grabaciones como solista superan los 40 CDs. Es también compositora de cine, de teatro y televisión. Es ganadora del doble premio Grammy, entre muchos otros. En 1993 recibió el nombramiento de la Orden del Imperio Británico, por eso le expresamos nuestro respeto llamándola Dame Evelyn Glenny. Cuenta con más de 100 premios internacionales, incluyendo el Polar Prize. Hoy integra la Evelyn Glenny Collection, como vemos detrás de ella, estos maravillosos instrumentos de percusión de todo el mundo con el fin de abrir un centro dedicado a la escucha. Tenemos el gusto de poder decir que ella es doctora honoris causa por 17 institutos de estudios críticos eh, del 2018. Y el tema de nuestra conversación es el siguiente, dado que a lo largo de su vida ha interrogado y ensanchado los mundos del sonido y de la música, dado que desde los ocho años ha vivido con sordera profunda, la pregunta es si aún tiene sentido pensar que Evelyn Glenny ha, ha sido incluida en los mundos de la música y del sonido. Very welcome, Dame Evelyn Glenny. It's really a pleasure to talk to you again. Um, welcome to this talk and we are describing ourselves for the benefit of our public. Thank you very much, Benjamin, and thank you everyone for having me and giving me this opportunity to have a discussion together. My name is Evelyn Glenny. I am white. I have long gray hair. I'm wearing all black, a black t-shirt and a black top, and I'm also wearing silver colored glasses. Um, and behind me are a collection of instruments from the over 2000 instruments in this particular room that I'm in. So lots of shapes and different sizes and colors and textures. <laughs> Fantastic. Evelyn, so tell us, how have you been keeping during the pandemic? Well, it's been such an interesting experience for my industry and indeed for so, so many others throughout the world. And um, since March, basically all of the concerts and events were eliminated from the diary. So suddenly we went from a fairly busy schedule to absolutely an empty landscape. And so that was really interesting as regards to then, what do you focus on? So lots of different questions arose. And suddenly I was sort of living in a landscape of routine. So my life hasn't been of, of any kind of, or had any sort of routine at all since I was probably at school. So suddenly since March, I could get up at the same time every day. I could come here to the office, you know, at the same time each day. Um, I could go home. I could wake up in the same time zone, in the same country and so on, be in my own bed. So this was kind of unusual. Um, but what it did do was that it opened up the possibilities. So with all of the, the sort of bleakness that seemed to, to be coming our way, almost like a tsunami, 
we've always got to think, well, what, what, you know, can we do in this situation? And it gives us a chance to really listen to ourselves. And that's what happened to me in March, uh, because no longer was I really in a position to practice repertoire for particular concerts coming up. All of those had disappeared. So I knew that I had to keep myself physically well and also mentally well. And what I decided to do as one of the things was to basically concentrate each month on a particular instrument. So for example, from March until April, I concentrated on the Irish Boron. Now this is a frame drum from Ireland and I hadn't played this instrument for about 30 years. And so this was a real opportunity to see how techniques had developed how it was being used in today's musical landscape. The following month, I concentrated on the Indian Kanjira, which is an even smaller frame drum. And suddenly I was catapulted into this amazing world of Kanjira and the players, and again, how it's used on the world stage, and so on and so forth. And so it really made sure that I was exercising different muscle groups but at the same time expanding my knowledge, not only as a musician, but as a sound creator and as a percussion player. So really this whole period, apart from, from that one project, really um, allowed me a chance to, to, to think, well, what else can I do that is different to playing my instruments? Mm -hmm. It sounds wonderful. Um, well, and I... I was sorry, Benjamin, just to interrupt, because I was so inspired when I was last in Mexico City and you took me to um, a colleague of yours who has the largest collection of, of musical instruments, not only Mexican musical instruments, and it was absolutely astounding for me to see this collection. And I still have very, very vivid images of that visit and the sheer warmth and kindness that was shown towards me and, and this sort of passion that we had towards percussion and, and sound creation. And it was just a wonderful way to build bridges. And so I felt that I could perhaps tap into my own collection during uh, the, the whole lockdown period and try to re-engage with the instruments. That's fantastic. I think we will return to your collection. And also, I think it's important to note your use, very deliberate use of the word to listen in response to the pandemic and the pandemic situation. And it is, of course, a word one might expect from you. And it is a word that we will, of course, come back to. Um, now, as you know, in this seminar, we are reflecting on the notion of inclusion, which we find rather pro problematic in its current use. And um, it's, a, it's a real treat to be able to discuss these issues with you. Um, as I told you a few days ago, um, I want to begin by citing a passage of yours in, a, in an interview um, of, from last year where you um, cite the, 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 the notion of inclusion in quite a, an elegant and positive light. You say, I've learned that inclusion is so important and we shouldn't assume that different people with the same label will have the same experience. Someone shouldn't need to have a sensory loss to make us think about how we communicate with them. Mm -hmm. Is that your general take on inclusion? It is, and in a way, I was so fortunate when I was young to go to a school in the north of uh, Scotland, Aberdeenshire, and it was the first community school that was built in the northeast of Scotland. And when I say a community school, what it was was that this was a centre for the community. So during the day, it was a school for young people. And then in the evening and weekends, it belonged to the community. And that meant that it was, it was permissible for all people in that area to use the building. Now, the whole ethos of the school was that every child has a story to tell. 
Now, actually, that's quite powerful when you think about it, because when you think about that, it, it gives us no option but to listen. We want to read that story. Um, we want to read that person. We want to focus and concentrate on that person. We want to engage with that person to find out what the story is all about. And the story will obviously evolve as we go through our lives. And so it's almost like a piece of music. You know, we don't just sort of play the first bar and repeat the first bar or the first measure forevermore. The piece of music has to move forward. And so just with our lives, you know, it's like a piece of music. We, we move forward. It's one great big phrase of music. So, you know, I was so lucky that in a way the school was open to all children, no matter what their circumstance. So the school was kitted out in such a way that there were ramps there if a child happened to be in a wheelchair. The, the colour scheme in the corridors and in the classrooms were such that they were pleasing and, and thought out for sight impaired kids. Um, there was a particular room, a sensory room, for hearing impaired kids that cut out an awful lot of the, the background noise and so on. Um, there were support teachers there. I mean, when I was there, once a week there was a support teacher for hearing impaired kids like myself, just making sure we were up to speed with homework and so on. And, uh, and, and so it was a totally inclusive school. And so we just all mixed together naturally, and that's what kids do. You know, they're, they're, they're not at that point where they're putting things in compartments or boxes and you belong there and you belong there. So I think it's absolutely essential that through education and just that natural evolvement um, that, that happens, you know, in the playing field, in the classroom, in, the, in that sort of, you know, age spectrum of youngsters, that it's the time that we can best understand and digest what it is to be hearing impaired what it might be to be sight impaired, what it might feel like to be in a wheelchair. And of course, not everybody, you know, has the same experience if they're in a wheelchair or if they're deaf or whatever, but at least it gives that understanding. But more importantly, the staff members are feeding this ethos whereby if you happen to be in a wheelchair, you absolutely belong in the sporting department. If you happen to be deaf, you completely belong to the music department. If you happen to be uh, blind, you absolutely belong to the art department. So the school was about building bridges, not walls. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, so we understand this was the context of your early musical training. Is that it correct? Was, yes, it was the context of my early musical training, um, but I think also um, perhaps it went deeper than that. Um, I think this whole ethos of listening to someone's story um, is so um, comparable to listening to a piece of music. You know, we can listen to a piece of music and the impact of that piece and we can say, oh, I like that or, oh, no, I don't like that. And so we're very good at just sort of creating um, an assumption of something. And it's such a dangerous thing when we don't give things time. Everything needs time. You know, for me to be a percussion player, I've had to practice for years and years and years and years. And that will go on for the rest of my life. You know, there will always be things that have to be improved. For me to digest a piece of music, it needs time. For me to work with other musicians, it needs time. So I think time is the greatest asset that we can possibly embrace um, and, and have patience with in a way. Um, but yes, you're right in that I happened to have a percussion teacher when I started percussion from the age of 12 who you know, saw this young girl, you know, with hearing aids and, you know, thought, right, well, how are we going to, how are we going to negotiate this? How are we going to deal with this situation? Because his whole um, landscape of a musician was that, well, I think it needs to be heard through the ear. But he was open enough as a teacher, because the school was open, to think, well, hold on a second, how else can we deal with this situation, you know? So he completely sort of erased what his thinking was as regards to music coming through the ears. And just, he suddenly struck a timpani 
uh, a kettle drum. And of course, a timpani is very resonant, but we hadn't really thought about that at the time. But when he struck that drum, he just waited. He absolutely waited. And he waited not only just to, to digest the, the actual impact of the drum, but the journey of the sound. And he suddenly said afterwards, he said, my gosh, you know, this drum really does resonate. Can you actually physically feel this sound? And that was the beginning of putting my hands on the wall of the music room and he, he struck the drum again and then he changed the pitch and gradually I would be feeling those pitches in different parts of my hands. Now this was the first step of realizing that our body actually is like a huge ear, it's like a resonating chamber, it really is. And it's interesting that if you cover the top of a marimba resonator or a xylophone resonator or a vibraphone resonator or any kind of tube and then you strike the bar on top, it will be absolutely dead. No matter how hard you strike that bar, you'll still get the same sound color, but no more. Eventually it will give up and say, no, I can't give you any more. But when you release your hand and strike that bar, the whole sound blooms like a flower. So the dynamics will go horizontally and vertically. You know, it, it, it goes completely, it fills the whole room. So it isn't just a, a case of, oh, something's soft and now something's loud and you have to show that action. Actually, loudness can be at the presence of the whole body, the whole weight of the body coming down on that surface. So it's a very different kind of feel. And that's what he was asking me to do, was involve that whole body in the acceptance of the initial strike, pay attention to the journey of the sound, so the resonance of the sound, and then you have the decision as to how then you want to link the next sound. And a lot of that linking is to do with paying attention to the audience, how they are, to the acoustics of the room. So it's, it's, it's really involving an awful lot of other aspects rather than what the music says on the page. So it really is the difference between looking at that page, translating what's on that page, adhering to the rules, but then taking that and interpreting that sound story into the space you're in. And that includes the audience. So really, that I'm trying to find out what the story is of the audience, and they're trying to find out what the story is of the piece of music. So you know, it goes back to this listening again. It's it's you're you're always listening to something, even if you're sitting in an empty room, you're still present there. The room is still present. The acoustic is still present. Mm -hmm. um, well, what what you describe is very beautiful. And it even suggests to me that, in fact, one might think of the relation between listening and inclusion in terms of synonymity um, on the basis of what you've said and of the story you've just told. Would you, would you take that? Yes, absolutely. I think listening is the glue, you know, to almost every situation. I mean, when we think of the workplace, you know, a business environment or, um, you, you know, domestically or, or um, any kind of environment, it's to do with listening. It really is. I mean, you can imagine that, you know, let's say you go into a restaurant or something, you know, you open that door and immediately, you know, all of your senses are coming together, but it's the listening aspect. And I don't mean listening as in the noise or the sound or the music that's being played. I mean, just grasping all of that atmosphere together, bringing the sense of smell, the sense of touch, the visuals, the, 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 the hearing aspect, everything. So it's not about how we think of senses to be. It's this inner kind of, I can't quite describe it because it's not a thing of confidence either. It's just, a, presence really it's engaging with, with what's there so it's not analyzing in any kind of way it's not making judgment or anything like that it's simply accepting what's there and then how we can engage with that so it's, it's exactly like a piece of music you know you look at that score 
and you know you can immediately think to yourself all oh, right so what are all the challenges in this piece or oh where are all the difficult parts in this piece and oh you know oh that looks a, a bit bit difficult oh that looks ooh, awkward and you know you're you're drawing out all of the negatives there but if you're looking at that piece and thinking wow so what is this all about you know what's this landscape here and you're you're you're, you're starting with almost like this wonderment almost like a child with a brand new toy and then the possibilities are there and and sure enough when you do come across challenges you're already so far down the road of making this work that actually you know new possibilities arise and, and new ways of communication engagement and appreciation come to the fore mm -hmm. so inclusion is a form of listening and listening is inclusion Absolutely. Right. Now, um, in passing, you mentioned something very important, which is um, you, you did this um, pointing to the preconceived ideas about what each sense is about. Um, in this interview that I read, you call that perhaps putting things in a box. You say, I think that sometimes people just want to put you in a box. But through my experiences as a musician who also happens to be deaf, I've been able to challenge this. So um, challenge is also an important part of your of your experience and certainly of your career. What what else could you say about challenging things? Well, I, I, I feel as though I'm fairly um, a childlike at heart because I like to, whenever I approach an, an instrument, I like to imagine that it's the first time I'm seeing that instrument or the same with a piece of music, which is why it's very difficult um, when I'm asked, what's your favorite instrument? What's your favorite composer? What's your favorite mu uh, piece of music? And it is whichever one is in front of me. And, and I feel that you know, when you realize that the amazing thing that, we, that human beings have, which is the imagination, and we all have imagination, that then suddenly the sky is the limit, you know. So, for example, as a musician, I might learn the, the basics of an instrument, the rules of that particular instrument. But I might think to myself, OK, I might have a conga or a cajon in front of me. but what about some of the techniques I've learned from marimba playing? How can they be perhaps experimented with on the cajon or on the conga? So it might look or appear ridiculous, you know, or people might say, Yo, you, get, you, know, you, you, you never play a conga like that and you mustn't use those mallets on, on a cajon and, and so on and so forth. Well, why not? You know, is there a book that actually says, please do not do this or do not do that? So it's really extending the possibilities. And once you start actually practicing that, it's almost like the art of practicing, uh, you know, the, the creation of your own opportunities rather than just waiting for the phone to ring or an email to, to come into your inbox. You have to keep, keep nurturing your own garden and, and planting those seeds to see which ones might grow and which ones may not. And some may not grow and that's absolutely fine but that's that's a learning experience as well so you know so much i think of, of what i do i can in a way transfer into so many other aspects of of my life um, of my engagement with with projects with people with collaborations with all sorts of things and uh and and i mean i think that's also what collaborations are about um, it's always, you know, this give and take, give and take, and, and you know, it's always about thinking that, well, we're, we're, we want to sort of push our boundaries here. We don't want to be in the comfort of our own four walls and hope that person will feel comfortable in our four walls and I will feel comfortable in theirs. This is about both of us or all of us exploring no man's land and, you know, some things will work, some things won't. So it's it's that sort of thing. We know that this is about pushing the boundaries. So I think to be um, any kind of um, not only a creative artist, but, but in anything that we do, 
um, it, it's we've got that opportunity um, to just think a little bit outside of the box, but we have to take those little steps. Uh huh. So, um, I mean, it's it's fantastic the way you've you've spoken both about inclusion and about challenging. Um, and you've described both terms in a way that is, in a way, very complementary. Um, your perspective seems to be that being inclusive is being able to think outside of the box as well. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I've been in so many situations whereby, um, as a musician, whereby I may have to play a brand new piece of music, uh, play that with a conductor whom I've never met before, play it with an orchestra whom I've never uh, performed with before, play the piece of music in a hall I've never been to before, in front of an audience I've never seen before. So suddenly everything is new. The idea of performing is not new. Um, the idea of performing in front of an orchestra or in front of an audience is not new. But if we hang on to those old things or the familiar things and not think, well, how can I make this different this time? How can I make this into a different experience this time? Then we're forever going to be, oh, well, this is what I did last time. This is what I did last time. This is, you know, how I felt last time. We, we have to think, well, now we have a, a new opportunity to engage with this audience or engage with this piece of music. And we have often a really short period of time to get something together. Now, often language can be a barrier. So sometimes I you know, can't speak the language. I haven't learned the language of, of so many places I go to. And therefore, we have to communicate and open up the channels in such a way that we have that same aim of getting this piece of music together and, and giving as good a performance as we possibly can for our audience. And so it's amazing how then the other senses come into play, how the idea of patience comes into play. So giving people space to say something, and I don't mean say something through words, but just the presence of doing something, whether it's through an instrument, experimenting with a musical phrase, whatever it is, giving them space to try to, to get what it is they want to, to describe out there. And, and that's really, really important. And of course, you do your homework beforehand, you learn the piece of music and so on. But the idea of so many interpretations then coming to the fore means that you have to keep your mind elastic and embrace the opportunity that, well, you know, all of us matter here. We really do. We've all got the same aim, but it's absolute teamwork. And I can't really think of many things whereby we do something in complete and utter isolation. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you therefore think about the doubts that some of us have with respect to the way that currently the notion of inclusion is being used um, that I might describe as including into the box rather than including opening the box, which is pretty much the opposite from what you've been saying. Hmm. I, I think um, it, it's, I mean, I sometimes get disappointed. I sometimes get frustrated with that. Um, because, again, we have to understand an individual's situation um, because it is very easy to, to clump something together. I mean, so many times, um, I mean, it can be maybe twice a month we get emails um, from people, um, albeit, you know, they're, they're wanting to make things better, but whereby they would like to experiment with a a device that allowed deaf people to hear music better. Now, this is a classic example whereby obviously they want to do something positive, so we have to commend that. Um, but it's clumping all deaf people together and assuming that we're all going to experience music together. There are some 
deaf people who just simply don't like certain music, just as there are some hearing people who don't like certain music, and that's that. You know, it's quite natural. And uh, and some people have more music in their homes than others. That, that's perfectly natural for any situation. Um, but somehow we're inclined to, to sort of get those those scales a bit, a bit skewed. And so this is when there's an opportunity then to perhaps talk about, you know, my situation with deafness, my de situation with sound, my situation with listening, another person's situation, and so on and so forth. So we have to also think, well, where is technology and where is medicine right now in relation to disability? You know, we, we're seeing so many people come back from uh, areas of conflict, so our soldiers coming back with, you know, no arms, no legs, and so on. Now, long ago, that was just such a traumatic, traumatic thing uh, for somebody to imagine, and you would then think, well, they're just not going to be able to do this, they're not going to be able to do that. But now, with prosthetics that have just been so extraordinarily advanced, you know, it's it's really amazing what people now can do. And it's the same, you know, with cochlear implants. It's the same with the amount of different types of hearing aids we have. It's the same with the openness and discussion that musicians have as regards to hearing loss. Uh, it's, it, you know, we're talking much more openly um, about the types of uh, in-ears that musicians can now use in order to, um, you, you know, not get such an amount of sound coming from, let's say, the brass section or the winds or whatever it may be, or percussion. And this open discussion has gone an awful long way to understanding now what hearing and therefore listening is all about. So, you know, it, it's really quite interesting. And I think that if we can really, you know, nurture that, that avenue of discussion and to know that what might work for one person isn't necessarily going to work for the other, and we just can't clump this disability, deafness, blindness, and so on into just that one box, um, it, it's, it, that's just not a, a productive thing to happen. Yeah. Um, I am amused because your your notion of inclusion is so generous and so rich that one can hardly question it. Um, well, and... it sorry, Benjamin, sorry. I, I was just going to say that, you know, when we, when a baby is born and we realize that something there's a, a, a situation whereby you see a baby has a challenge. Now, where is this challenge? Is the challenge being planted in your mind? Because it certainly hasn't been planted in the baby's mind, you know. So, but yet the sheer kind of love and, and that the parents have towards that baby, you know, is so beyond anything that they see this beautiful baby that they're going to nurture and, and give all the opportunities to and, and take care of and, you know, love them like, you know, it, it's, it's beyond anything that, that we can imagine. So they're not seeing a baby that, oh, uh, is imperfect, that, oh, oh, now, you know, oh, I don't love you quite, you know, the same way because you have a leg missing or, 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 or you're blind or you're deaf or whatever. They're going to absolutely nurture that baby. And so, unfortunately, it's outside forces that create then the challenges that then the baby has as it's growing up. And it's always the external that can change what happens internally. And so I think what I'm really um, saying and, and what you have to do as a musician is always try to draw what's inside of you out through your instrument and then to the audience. So there's no way I could survive as a musician if I was constantly looking at performances on YouTube or any other way and thinking, right, how can I take that performance and put it inside of me? So when I'm trying to copy something and, and uh, it's never going to work. I have 
to find my own journey internally, listen, and you know, that can be a bumpy ride where some things work, some things don't. Sometimes you get bad reviews, sometimes you get good reviews, but each time you know what, the, what you've done is that you've gone inside of yourself, listened to yourself, and come out the other, other end. And therefore, people will feel that genuine story that you're giving. And that, therefore, they'll have a better understanding of who I might be or who someone else might be. So I think that's really, really important. So educationally, you know, we can really nurture this aspect. And I find that improvisation is really good here. It's giving people permission to zoom out on their situation and to zoom in. And zooming in is really listening to what's inside and then giving that and then being able to zoom out to see, so how has that, you know, related or impacted to other people and how have they, they then use that as a springboard to perhaps their ideas and so on. So that, that's how I feel. Right. Could, could you tell us a bit about your experience during your um, approach to the Royal Academy of Music? Um, because of course, taken to the institutional level, um, it becomes political in a in a rather different way, and I mean you you had to challenge many uh, presuppositions to actually get the the professional training that you then receive. Yes, it's interesting because when you think of even the word institution, um, it almost feels like a box in a way. And, uh, and I feel that, you know, these kind of establishments or further education really should be about, ooh, you know, going in this direction rather than honing in. So on the one aspect, yes, you're, you're attending to the detail and, and whatever it is, and you're, you know, learning minute things, subtle, subtle things that will then make the big difference. But at the same time, there's this balance of also looking in all directions to expand your experiences. So it's an interesting uh, situation. And I think for me, when I auditioned, um, it was still very much um, of uh, the, the ethos whereby the majority of the students would graduate and then go into orchestras. So they would become orchestral players or possibly teachers. Um, but those were the two main professions that people went in for. Now, I made the decision from the age of 15 that I wanted to be a solo percussionist. And so therefore, when I went to the academy and said I would like to be a solo percussionist, of course, you know, this they simply could not visualize such a thing, first of all. But also they had a real issue accepting a deaf musician because they had absolutely no idea how they would cater for that or indeed how an orchestra, so even if they did take me in, how an orchestra would ever accept a deaf musician into their orchestra. So here I was facing external problems in a way. So people who were, um, who were talking about these challenges that hadn't even entered my mind because for me, I wanted to be the solo percussionist and I didn't want to be in an orchestra. So there was no, issue there from my perspective but for them there was and i think this is really interesting then because then it's a case whereby were they listening to what i was saying that i wanted to be a solo percussionist you know but because they were in over a hundred year history of putting people into orchestras, it was then hard for them to visualize outside of that landscape. So it was a classic example of, of um, I suppose, lack of listening and whereby we had to listen to each other's story in order to, to, to you know, create a new landscape in a way. Now, fortunately, when I auditioned there, I had to audition twice. Uh, because the first time around it was no, we cannot accept a deaf musician. There's no way an orchestra will will accept that person. And solo percussion, what is that? No one else is doing it. Um, to then one person on the panel who actually said, well, hold on a second, let's step back here because if we're now going to start accepting or not accepting people 
who are of the standard, so they recognize that I was of the standard to get in because I'd given a, a positive addition. But if they're then going to pick and choose people because they've got no arms, they've got no legs, they're blind, they're deaf, they're this, they're that, this is a really dangerous, dangerous situation to be in. And, you, you know, we have seen extraordinary people in our history who have had all sorts of challenges and who have really changed the landscape for mankind and womankind. We have really, really, you know, had extraordinary situations. And so this was an example, I'm not saying I was extraordinary in any kind of way, but I'm saying that, you know, you, you've got to be very careful when you're dealing with this situation. So thankfully, I was granted a second audition. And from that, they then really listened to the next layer of that story. And with that listening, they found a fairly stubborn young person, a fairly stalwart person, a fairly kind of focused person, a person who knew what they wanted to do, they just didn't know how to get there, and so on. And it was the beginning of the academy to realize that, hold on a second, is this now a shift? So just in the past few months with the with COVID-19, we've seen a big shift in, in not just in my industry, but globally in so many different industries. It's almost like a uh, an earthquake that has happened and and the fault lines have created a new kind of landscape and that's what's ha that's what happened back in those days with with the audition so it opened up then the possibilities for the academy to think all we have to do is listen to a young person and say is he her is he or she good enough to get in to this establishment. If they are, we accept them. If they're, if they're not, we don't accept them. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is, of course, very important for institutions in the Spanish-speaking world. So I'm very happy that you're mentioning this. And I want to ask you, um, during your later career, um, did you face similar obstacles both on on account of deafness and on account of concentrating on percussion um how has that been well it's interesting because as a solo player now it, this might be different if i happen to be a member of the orchestra or a member of something else but as a solo player, whereby my career has basically been about going around the world, more or less myself, really, um, as a solo player, that actually you don't get into uh, an organization deep enough to know what they're thinking. And, and that's good. <laughs> that's fine, because it just means that you go and do what you do. And you know you try to create as, as a positive impact as as possible, and time is money at the end of the day with these organisations. So when you are a guest with an orchestra, you have X amount of rehearsals in a set period of time, and then you have to deliver those goods to the audience. So there's no time to oh could I just have an extra hour oh could we you know it doesn't work like that. So you basically have been hired or employed as a musician not as a deaf musician not as a musician who is five foot two not as a musician who has long gray hair not as a musician who is scottish and so on and so forth so you are hired as a musician to perform this piece of music or this concert whatever it might be and that is what you do you then absolutely get on with all of your colleagues and work as a team to, to get the result that we all want. So it's really clear, it's really simple what has to happen. And that's important so that we're all focused on that same goal. I think I probably um, had more challenges as a percussion player rather than as someone who is deaf. And for the reasons that I've explained, you know, where you, you go in and you deliver the goods as best as you can. But as a percussion player, I remember one in the early, early days whereby I was asked to play a concerto and I'd set up all of my instruments at the front of the orchestra, which should be absolutely the case for that particular piece of music. 
and the conductor walked in and he said, oh, uh, um, oh, would it be possible for you to set your instruments at the back of the stage? And I was so aghast at that, I was completely dumbfounded, to be honest. And I said to him, well, I'd be very happy to set my instruments at the back of the stage, provided the next time you do a piano concerto, the piano is at the back of the stage, or a violin concerto, the violin is at the back of the stage, and so on. So, you know, equal. So the composer had absolutely stated that these instruments are positioned at the front of the stage, and so on. And so it took a little while sometimes for uh, conductors to, to feel comfortable, as it were, to have something in front of the strings, you know, something in front of, of them, really. Um, and because it adjusted their whole sound world, they were used to having the strings there and used to having the percussion sounds at the back. So to suddenly have percussion sounds at the front really, you know, took a little bit of oral adjusting in a way. But again, time, you know, that's our biggest healer, our, our, our biggest saviour, really. And, and that's what really happened, is that conductors needed time to just sort of feel the percussion at the front of the orchestra. Has it been challenging to build your percussion-centred repertoire? Um, it's been... Yes and no, to be honest. I mean, in the early days, I had this innocence whereby I would just write to lots and lots of different composers, asking them to write pieces of music for me. And I, you know, I had no knowledge as regards to how to commission pieces of music. I just wrote to them and some of them replied to me and said, yes, they would be happy to write a piece of music. However, my fee is X, Y or Z. And so I thought, oh, a fee? I, I, how, uh, what, what do I pay you with? You know, I, I don't know um, how to get this money. And so that opened up another avenue, another pathway, another vein that you had to explore to find out how do you commission this? How do you get the money in place in order to pay the composer? Mm -hmm. And uh, and then in the early days, of course, a lot of the commissions were supported by the Arts Council. And so they would support pieces 100%. And then, of course, times changed, and then they supported pieces maybe 75%, then 50%, and then it grew less and less and less. It was really difficult for them um, to have the means to support a commission fully. And so this meant getting other organizations involved. It then took longer to commission pieces of music. And then, of course, orchestras have gone through financially, you know, financial challenges and so on. So a lot of the commissions are shared. So an orchestra will build a consortium of maybe five or six different orchestras, orchestras from maybe North America or from South America or from Europe or from the Far East. And so you may have an orchestra from each territory supporting one piece of music. So that can take a long time. So an example of that is the concerto I had written by the American composer John Carigliano. It took 10 years from the time of asking him to write the piece of music to then giving the world premiere of that piece. That's a long time. So that's just the way it is. So it hasn't always been the same route all the way through. It's, it's really changed. In America, there used to be um, a lot of the early pieces were supported by um, fairly wealthy uh, people, just private individual people. Um, and they would just say, choose your composer and they'll support the commission. Of course, that happens far less nowadays. Um, so you've got to find ingenious ways, such as the internet, to try to get people uh, through crowdfunding and all sorts of things to support commissions. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, we, we're coming to the, the, the final question, which is, um, looking back to your career and your experience up to now, Evelyn, um, would you say it's marked by the, 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 the practice of inclusion or is it more marked by the practice of challenge and challenging various prejudices and so on? It's a really, really interesting question. Um, I'd like to think it's the former, 
And I think perhaps it's a bit of both. I think that, you know, the nature of life is that it isn't just plain sailing ever, you know. So no matter what you do, how you do things, um, what the expectation might be, um, it's, there's always going to be peaks and troughs to everything. So I think probably to answer your question, it's a bit of both. And but nevertheless, I feel that when we can possibly concentrate on the idea of patience, um, which is a form of listening, when we can open up that landscape to just give ourselves another chance, another chance, another chance to engage, um, then we can only say to ourselves then, okay, well, I've tried my best there. I've tried my best to understand. But we've also got to realize that, you know, when you're young, and, you know, I remember as a as a, a youngster, you know, sometimes being really impatient or sometimes I came across saying, oh, I know everything and da, 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 da. You know, you've kind of got a blase sort of and you just sort of go head first and, and wham, you know, things hit you. And it's the same with playing a piece of music. You think you know how to play a mu piece of music, but then suddenly you realize that, oh, actually, you know, maybe not or you want to show all of your instruments and play all of your instruments and the kitchen sink. Um, but actually now I realize that less is more. And so using fewer objects, fewer instruments, but getting more out of that means that my attention to that and imagination to that can be better explored. Now, this can only happen through the natural journey of time. So I don't think that we can necessarily beat people up if they don't have the same notion as what you or I might have at this particular time in our lives. So it's understanding and putting yourself in the shoes of someone else. Um, but nevertheless, I think that through education and nurturing that sense of inclusiveness um, through education, through how we communicate, you know, how we share our experiences is absolutely key. I really do believe that. Um, and, you know, we can only hope that, that this can, um, you know, move forward in, in a positive way. One thing I have noticed since March is that we've really been listening to people's stories more. I found that our whole concept and, I, and ideas of personalities and TV, you know, personalities or well-known people or all of that has really kind of shifted in a strange way because we've really been listening because this whole pandemic has hit everybody in one way or another, big or small. It's, it's impacted all of us. It really has that we have been absolutely listening to the story of our next door neighbor, the story of our shopkeeper, the show story of that person over there. It's amazing how in this country, the much older generation, i.e. people in their 90s hitting 100, over 100, have been absolutely key in our motivation because we've been listening to their stories, listening to, to how they have engaged with this pandemic, listening to all the amazing things they have done. It's been the much older generation that, that's been full of inspiration for us all, which is really interesting because that just, you know, hasn't been the case. It's kind of been a token, oh, isn't that amazing sort of thing. But this has been impactful and it's given us the realization that every generation we have to listen to the story of every generation because their value is absolutely paramount to how we all move forward yeah thank you so much evelyn thank we, you we will now listen to the questions from the public thank you so much Pleasure. thank you benjamin if I can warm up the conversation, I want to put a short final question to you. Um, if in political terms we talked about inclusion with the women's movements and, and feminist groups, they would be quite um, offended to be offered inclusion. And we're wondering 
whether it should be different from uh, people with disability generally. Does that difference make sense? I don't think there, there has to be any difference at all. Um, you know, I think the thing about people is that we all have imaginations, you know, we're all um, capable of reaching out, of creating an impact. So I really don't feel that we can begin to dissect uh, humankind in such ways. I think that has to now just sort of um, gradually fade away and and where the lines are completely blurred and that we are all capable. And I think this has definitely been seen through, um, you know, how technology and medicine has moved forward as regards to serving all people in, in how they function physically. Um, but I think also, I mean, one thing I did learn um, quite profoundly, actually, was when I came in contact with, uh, I, I went into a, a residential home for elderly people with dementia, and all of them um, had lost the ability to speak. So um, they were quite uh, severe uh, as regards to their journey with dementia. And what was so interesting is that you could have just put them all in a box and said, oh, well, they've got dementia and they're past it. And, you know, so we're just waiting for them to die. And, and that's it. And I mean, I cannot tell you that I probably had the most profound lesson in listening um, I've ever had by engaging with them. Because really that sense whereby I was in their space, in their private space, in their room, and not knowing them, not having met them before, and trying to build the story through leaving time at the door and just being present in that situation. So I had to leave time at the door. I had to leave the fact that I was a musician at the door. It was completely irrelevant to that situation and i think that's one of the things that we can do is sort of almost take off the tags that we give ourselves so you know i don't wake up in the morning and say to myself oh hello musician evelyn you know or good morning musician evelyn percussionist evelyn or whatever i just you know ah evelyn nice to be alive and you know doing what you do and it's it's not it's not putting the tags on. And I think that, you know, we have this chance to almost um, rip the tags off and and just allow us the space to to be untagged, I suppose, you know, and and knowing that everybody has the capacity um, to be placed in lots of different ways. But we have to be strong enough to say, well, this is where I would like to be. This is where I feel my skills are. This is where I feel I can create an impact. And, you know, rather than perhaps um, assuming that you belong part of a part of, of, of a group. But having said that, we are all different. You know, some people will like that and, and some people won't. And and we, we also have to accept that. So mm -hmm. there's there's a balance there. So it's difficult to answer your question, really. Okay, so um, many people have felt uh, moved and inspired by your words, Evelyn. No. Um, many signs of deep appreciation. Um, we have a first question from Beatriz Miranda, who's my co-curator, and she would like you to, to talk a bit more about the meaning of listening. Um, what else could you tell us about listening, which is, of course, perhaps your central um, theme, the way you present yourself, you, you present yourself publicly these days and, and, and for the last few years? Um, I, it's funny because, you know, sometimes when I think about that, I don't really feel um, I can just say it is this or it is that. Um, and I'm not sure if I really want to say it is this or it is that, because I think this is something that belongs to us all, 
the meaning is what we make of it in a way. And I think, for example, if I use again the analogy of music, I might play a piece of music and I might feel it or play it in a certain way. Someone else comes along and plays exactly the same piece of music and they might feel it in another way. And so it, nothing is right or wrong with that. It's just quite simply a different feel. It could be a tempo change. It could be just a sense of touch that gives it then a different feel. And each way is permissible. And, you know, it's difficult to uh, feel as though you can grasp everybody's situations. Um, and the, the, we ourselves as individuals have to sort of look deep inside of ourselves to think, well, what is listening for me? Have I really thought about it? Maybe not, you know. So what would happen then if I just took a little moment to think, well, you know, if I didn't listen to my husband or my partner or my wife or my, my son or daughter or whoever it is in the way that perhaps I think I do, what might change? Or what would happen if I, you know, talk to you at this moment, but meanwhile, I was sort of looking over in this direction and talking to the drum on the shelf. I mean, it would have an extremely different feel, even if the same words, the same action was happening. So I think that really we, to say what listening is, it's about, I suppose, engagement. It's about presence. It's, they always say that life begins with listening and life ends with listening. And that's true because whether you're a baby, you're grasping everything, you're taking in such a mass amount of information. And for parents, you know, they're listening to every single move that their baby makes, you know, a little finger moves, a little eye moves, a little mouth moves, whatever, a gurgle, whatever. So it isn't necessarily to do with sound, but the listening of the baby has expanded like nothing on earth. And then when someone is, is about to pass away, suddenly the listening of that person becomes magnified. So I suppose we're trying to ask people to continue with this sort of um, idea of, of using a magnifying glass to listen, you know, that we've got this whole orchestra of life right there at our fingertips, you know, that we can listen to and we can be the musicians of that life you know um but i can't dictate how a bassoonist plays or how a trumpet player plays that bassoonist has to take responsibility of themselves and so that's what i think listening is all about because then the sense of trust will come in and that's absolutely crucial the sense of responsibility will come in that's really really important and so then all of these other things confidence you name it and then we listen to what people say, what people do, and we give the patience for the story to grow. So that, that's what I feel really with this. Mm -hmm. um, during our conversation, you spoke about the body as a giant ear. And Juan Rodriguez is asking for some suggestion to experiment and explore the possibilities of listening through your body. Mm. It's, it's interesting because one of the things that children have fun with, of course, is when they blow up a balloon, you know, just a normal balloon, and, uh, and they just hold the balloon. And you literally can, you know, say something yourself or have your, your friends or family say something. And you begin to feel the rhythm of the words. So you could be holding the, the balloon literally with your fingertips or, or with your hand, cup it with your hand in front of your, your, your sort of upper part of your body. And you could sing a song or you could shout or you could whisper, whatever it is. So I might say to you, hello, Benjamin, how are you today? And so you could feel the emphasis of certain words, especially of the vowels, and take note of that. And then I might say, how are you today? So emphasis on the you and see how the you resonates in your hand. Then I might say, how are you today? And what was the difference there? How are you today? And so on and so forth. And really build it up like that. Or you might sit in front of your television 
and just put the volume up. And again, just see the myriad of vibrations that are coming through a balloon or a single sheet of paper. Try taking your shoes off and just don't try to analyze at all. Just simply observe and see what happens when the television is on or when a piece of music is being played in your living room or, or kitchen or wherever. Um, and just see what happens. What happens if you sit on a wooden chair or a cushioned chair? Does anything happen? Is it more resonant through the wooden chair? What about your posture? You know, do you listen and feel sound differently if you crouch over or if you've got your hands crossed and your legs crossed like this where you're closing up your body? Or is it more easy to bring in sound when you're just opening up your body? I mean, imagine when I play an instrument and I'm all kind of huddled up and tense and so on. Everything then is closed up. Whereas if I'm absolutely letting the body be free and let it flow, the sound will have more chance to get out and really have color to it. So you're bringing the sound color into your body, as well as in my case as a musician, bringing the sound color out of my body. There is a question here about your experience with teachers and peers once you were taken by the the Royal Academy. Um, was it difficult? Was it easy? Was it a bumpy road? What was your experience with with the people in your circle? The, the people at the Academy were actually very supportive. I think there was really only one person um, who was not at all supportive as regards to solo percussion. Um, in that that was a difficult thing for him to digest. But really, um, the the staff members, once I'd been accepted and, um, you know, they could see a person who was willing to work and, and fit in and, and just get on, um, then they were absolutely fine. I had such a good pool of, of teachers, actually. And I think if anything expanded, um, it was possibly my piano playing and my general musicianship, um, because they basically allowed me to enter other classes in order to sort of expand other opportunities, um, just to be sure that everything was completely and utterly well covered. And, uh, and so I was very grateful for that. And so those areas really did expand quite, quite a bit. Um, and I think that it all boils down to, again, your own responsibility um, and not relying on other people. Um, I remember my father, he always said to me, don't expect anything. <laughs> you know, don't, I mean, you, you can expect things from yourself. Um, you can set goals and aims and all that kind of thing. But he said, don't expect anything as regards from other people. So always be sure that you can just look after your, your situation and you're not reliant on other people. And although, you know, we all work as a team and success never happens in isolation, nevertheless, it's that responsibility, your individual responsibility, which is quite different, um, it, that, that's really important. Um, and that all, again, is about openness in talking about your situation. So what you feel comfortable with, what you feel uh, nervous about or anxious about or uncomfortable with. And it's allowing people to know that so that then they can best support that situation. Someone else might be really comfortable in that situation and can take care of that bit of it or nurture you in order to, to take care of the situation. So it's always, it's like a web. We're all like this together. Um, Francisco Javier Rodriguez would like to know what the institutional impact of your entry to the academy um, was in other schools, in other organizations, and perhaps even in public policy. Well, all I can say for other organizations and other music institutions um, so I can't talk about other establishments, but for the music institutions within the UK, at least, 
um, they really did change their policy, and you know, it, it was absolutely it became absolutely standard that uh, all of these institutions would accept, provided there were the spaces, accept people um, on their ability as opposed to any other situation and and that was really really important and and it just meant that you you were gradually seeing youngsters go in there with various challenges of one sort or another um but it was opening up this diversity inclusiveness um respect understanding and so on and of course those people have become vital in the profession as a whole um, so they've created circumstances um, and a lot of understanding um, in so many aspects of the music umbrella, because of course music isn't just about playing an instrument, you know, you've got the whole administrative side, the managerial side of things, um, you've got music therapy, sound therapy, um, we, we have a, a, a lot of organisations who deal with music in hospitals and hospices, in prisons and young offenders places and so on. And, uh, and a lot of the people, um, you know, who have experienced various challenges themselves um, uh, are absolutely vital in those roles. We have a, a, um, a, a para orchestra, which is geared up to um, accept any musician with lots of different challenges and so this has really advanced the technology side of things you know making sure that technology and uh, the human being and that you know imagination and raw hand and so on can really work well together and some of the the compositions because of course we have really interesting compositions um, from people who have, have gone through all sorts of challenges and you know it's important to also remember that we're not just thinking about individuals who have been born with a certain situation or challenge, but people who have suddenly had an accident um, or have found themselves in a situation where their lives have changed greatly. And therefore, you know, the arts is absolutely crucial in reaching out to those people and then for them to be included in, in the profession. So really, really important. Mm -hmm. um... A couple of questions deal with um, the greater difficulties in some contexts, in some countries, as compared to others. Um, Mariana Tirado, for example, and Brenda Lucia Carlini um, are referring to, to that question. What would be your advice or your suggestion to people who perhaps um, face conditions that are harder in countries like ours in, in Latin America? Well, that's, that's a rather large question and I don't, you know, see myself as, as any kind of expert or anything like that in, in an arena of a, a country um, that I don't really know enough about politically or otherwise. And so I want to be really careful, I think, how I answer that. But what I have noticed in my whole um, professional career has seen, I've seen changes in countries. So, for example, um, I remember visiting Japan in my early years. And at that time, Japan still used the term deaf and dumb. And it was interesting because that term, certainly in, in the UK, uh, was seen as derogatory because they felt that um, deaf people were not dumb at all because dumb has that connotation of being stupid or silly. And uh, so uh, it was interesting that it was still used there. Um, however, for me to make any comment of that or to feel offended by that, it was important for me to understand a bit more about disability in Japan as a whole. Now, obviously, I was only peeping through the keyhole, you know, I wasn't an expert and, and it would have been, I feel, inappropriate, strangely, for me to sort of voice my opinions, say, how dare you, you know, call deaf people deaf and dumb and so on. 
And I didn't think that was right. It was, it was much more appropriate to find out what is the situation. And it took several years then afterwards, several trips to Japan, to see a slight change there. And part of that was because of the regularity of me going there and giving normal concerts. You know, so one minute they might have been seeing Ashkenazi play the piano or give a piano recital, the next minute Lang Lang or whatever it might be, and then me and then somebody else and so on. So I was just simply one of the musicians, you know, appearing on stage. And I think, you know, together with lots of other things, but that began to help. And then also once the internet really, you know, blossomed and we all had computers and so on, then a lot of Japanese people could then communicate with us and, and ask questions and send an email and express, you know, what they're going through and, and compare notes almost. So this was a big help as well. And then gradually the media changed, you know, their ways. They then began to question, oh, what is deafness? What is blindness? What is, you know, and so how are we actually treating our, our disabled people in this country? So lots of different things to now where it's much more open, it's more talked about, it's more visible in a way. Um, and it, that, that's, that's great. So it's, it's difficult to really know, you know, how a country can change without really knowing the landscape of, of the place. Right. So we, we come to the final question which is to do with the relation between listening and learning and mm. teaching. Mm. Um, what might you comment about the relation between teaching, learning and listening? Oh, that's a wonderful question. And I'd love some time to, to really think about that, to be honest. Um, I think, you know, I can only go with my own experience and I feel that the, the classic example that I've experienced myself was from my initial percussion teacher Ron Forbes whereby he listened to the individual and he wanted to create a different landscape for that individual he didn't know what that was so he was putting himself you know, in, in an unknown situation. And I think that learning is always about this, to and fro, to and fro, to and fro, rather than teacher, then knowledge, teacher, knowledge, teacher, knowledge, you know, going into the, the, the pupil. I don't feel that learning is all about feeding something into someone. I think it's about hold on a second, you know, what are we all experiencing here? It's the difference between telling something and telling the story of something where we're all characters in that story. And then we're all valued in that story. So there's no point in me going to an orchestra, being asked to perform with an orchestra, where I walk onto the stage with my set interpretation, this is what I practiced in my room, this is what I'm going to play, regardless of anything else that's happening there. I have to open myself up to those players. I think, what other things can I pick here that they're giving, you know, ideas and, and, and situations that I maybe haven't thought of, or I thought, oh, that's interesting, well, I'm not sure about this, but I'll give it a go. So it's, I realize that, the, the, you know, the challenges that teachers have as regards to, you know, gaining grades and, and the administrative side and the, the all sorts of things that, that impede in their time, you know, when, when I'm sure they'd love more time to engage with, with young people. Um, but if we can somehow, somehow um, just find the adventure of learning and to zoom out on a situation and to make links. One project I remember um, taking part in a few years ago, which is still ongoing, is a project called The Sounds of Science. And basically this is dealing with 2000 years worth of man-developed sounds. When we think of history, we normally read about history or we're told about history or we look at pictures of historical things, but we don't think about the sound of history. And so this was an ideal opportunity to think about starting with stone tool making. So we can all, you know, 
clunk two stones together or scrape two so stones together and the idea of stone tool making and then so what was happening in the rest of the world there so kind of timeline so what was happening in in the far east what was happening in in uh, in middle asia what was happening in europe what was happening in south america in north america and so on and so forth how was the world connected and so on and then the development of for yeah the development of, you know so then what did that lead to and all the way through to the sound of the first um computer really you know even our young people today haven't maybe been aware of the, the sound of the very first computer the sound of helium the sound of penicillin the sound of um uh, oh gosh i can't think now but lots of lots of different things but it meant that we were dealing with sound creation with music making with physics sciences with engineering with history and so on so this one project was linking all of these things together and i'm a big believer in trying to you know take a subject and then whoosh it goes like that you know so where else are we what else are we talking about and really linking different departments of your school and the learning together um, in order to engage with our young people well teaching the world to listen thank you thank you so much evelyn um, we are all extremely moved and we've really enjoyed the music it's been absolutely beautiful listening to you uh, <laughs> now so so thank, thank you very much thank you very much indeed and and i hope the rest of the conference goes well thank you for all your questions from our wonderful participants and thank you benjamin for just being the forever eloquent you <laughs> thank you okay bye bye bye